a big honor for me to speak in front of all of you. I've been several times to Dubai so far, and it's always a very special experience for me, especially this Friday programs. Juma programs. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and what I thought, Shivalov Prabhu told me to speak something, and I thought that I will speak about the uh, essence of sadhana. What is the meaning of sadhana, and what is supposed to happen with us, and how to perform sadhana properly, because sadhana is a very special gift of Vedic culture to the world. <clears throat> this very concept of sadhana, or spiritual practice, uh, is a very prominent feature of the original Vedic culture. So I wanted to uh, describe a little bit the science behind sadhana. And I will uh, uh, chant, we will chant together the fifth verse of the eighth chapter. Because the eighth chapter is called Attaining the Supreme, which implies sadhana. If any chapter of Bhagavad Gita deals with the practice as such, that's the eighth chapter. Therefore, it's very important for us to understand the meaning of this chapter in general, and uh, in particular, uh, this verse which we will chant together. Antakale, Antakale cha, cha mam, mam eva, eva smaran, smaran muktva, muktva kalevaram kale ya, ya prayati saha madbhavam yati na asti Atra Samshayaha Antakale Chamameva Smaran Muktva Kalevaram Yah Prayati Samad Bhavam Yatina Syatra Samshayaha Antakale Chamameva Smaran Muktva Kalevaram Yah Prayati Samad Bhavam Yatina Syatra Samshayaha Antakale Chamameva Smaran Muktva Kalevaram Yah Prayati Samad Bhavam Yatina Syatra Samshayaha Antakale At the end of life Cha also Mam me, me. Eva, Eva, certainly, certainly. Smaran, Smaran, remembering, remembering. Muktva, Muktva, quitting, quitting. Kalevaram, Kalevaram, the body, the body. Ya, ya, he who, he who. Prayati, Prayati, goes, goes. Saha, Saha, he, he. Matbhavam, Matbhavam, my nature, my nature. Yati, Yati, achieves, achieves. Na, Na, not, not. Asti, Asti, there is, there is. Atra, Atra, here, here. Samshayaha, Samshayaha, doubt. doubt. Translation. <clears throat> and whoever at the end of his life quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this, there is no doubt. Purport. In this verse, the importance of Krishna consciousness is stressed. Anyone who quits his body in Krishna consciousness is at once transferred 
to the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is the purest of pure. Therefore, anyone who is constantly Krishna conscious is also the purest of, of the pure. The word smaran, remembering, is important. Remembrance of Krishna is not possible for the impure soul who has not practiced Krishna consciousness in devotional service. Therefore, one should practice Krishna consciousness from the very beginning of life. If one wants to achieve success at the end of his life, the, the process of remembering Krishna is essential. Therefore, one should constantly, incessantly chant the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Chaitanya has advised that one has to be uh, uh, advised that one be as tolerant as a tree, Tarore Vasa Hishnuna. Uh, there may be so many impediments for a person who is chanting Hare Krishna. Nonetheless, tolerating all these impediments, one should continue to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare so that at the end of one's life, one can have the full benefit of Krishna consciousness. Antakale chamam evas maran muktva kale varam yak prayati samad bhavam yati nastyatra samsheha. And whoever at the end of his life quits his body remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this there is no doubt. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swamini Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Vyayavacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Jānu-lāṁ-jit-bujokna-kāvadātu-sankirtanāyaka-pitaro-kamalāya-dākṣa-viśvam-baro-dvijavaro-yuga-dhārma-pālo-vande-jagat-priyakaro-karunāvadh
and my wife is really like a goddess of fortune. <laughs> my question is, if you are not Narayana, how your wife will become a goddess of fortune? <laughs> so, but, <laughs> so many. <laughs> Oh, some people think that, you know, success means I have nice, obedient children, as if there are obedient children in this world. <laughs> uh, so many different ideas are there, but Krishna is speaking about the ultimate success. He says that the ultimate success, if we remember him at the end of our life, because he says, if you remember me, you attain Madhbhava. Yati Madhbhava. Uh, and in this he says, na asti uh, samsheha, na asti samsheha. There is no doubt about it. If you remember about me at the end of your life, for sure, 100%, guarantee. Uh, he gives all the insurance for this. You will come to me. You will attain my nature. Uh, and basically it means that your karma is finished. Because everything else, any other conception of success, means that you continue with the vicious circle of your karma. You have certain karma, and this karma is recorded in your DNA. What is DNA? DNA is just your karma. Nothing else. This is, this is what you have done. Or astrology, it's recorded in your astrological chart. Mars is there, Rahu is there, Ketu is there. Shani is there. And uh, believe it or not, Shani is in everyone's chart. I haven't seen chart where there is no Shani, or there is no Rahu, there is no Ketu. Some people say, you know, I want to have good karma. But how you can have good karma if Rahu and Ketu and Shani is there? <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it's not possible. <laughs> so, if you just do the same thing, it's a vicious circle. There is no real qualitative change, qualitative leap, so to speak. It's just the same old thing, uh, you know, birth, death, old age, disease, and again, birth, death, old age, and disease. And still people are so um, <clears throat> maddened, so infatuated by this fact that they want to achieve some temporary success. But Krishna says, here is the real success. The real success is to get rid of your karma. And <clears throat> this understanding of karma is unique for Vedic culture. As I said, as much as sadhana is unique, <clears throat> as much as the concept of dharma is unique, in the same way, this understanding of the law of karma, uh, very profound understanding, which is there in Vedic culture, nowhere else to be found. Of course, in Bible, there is some sort of formulation of law, of law karma. As you sow, you shall reap. Uh, so there is some understanding is there, but nowhere uh, uh, it is uh, so elaborately described uh, what is your karma and how you will be able to get rid of karma. Uh, and karma is a very interesting thing, you know, uh, the other day, yesterday, we were driving, and uh, Paramanand Prabhu asked me, you know, how much, how much it is uh, predetermined, uh, how much money I will earn, or whatever. <laughs> so according, uh, I will open you a secret. 80%, 20% you can change. Little bit here and there you can change. But uh, more or less, it is a general understanding among those people who study the law of karma, is that it's more or less 80% is fixed, and then what you will do during this life, how you behave yourself, how properly you behave, it may attract certain things, it may uh, change something here and there. Of course, uh, we're not talking about devotees now. We're talking about normal people who try to become uh, right and just and proper and behave themselves properly, then you can change, you can improve it, but more or less 80%, 75%, 80% or sometimes even more, uh, it is fixed. Example, I gave an example, and it's an interesting example how it is, works with the law of karma. 
uh, when I was a little child, and perhaps the group of devotees from Dubai who went to Russia, I don't know, if you went to Petergof, Peterhof near St. Petersburg, where the fountains, where there are many fountains, you went? Yes, so those, those devotees who were there know there is a, a king's palace, Russian Tsar's palace, very beautiful palace and uh, a huge park with many, many hundreds of fountains, different shapes and forms and different, different, different fountains. And among those fountains, there is a, a, a few fountains for children to play. And basically, these fountains is, uh, you know, they're playing and all of a sudden the water starts coming and they start ah, yelling and, you know, running away and then again, no water. So there is a particular fountain which is called stones. And the stones are there, many stones, and children are running and playing and, you know, trying to push these stones and all of a sudden, poof, water comes, and everyone just yells and runs away, and then again, no water. And then again, they uh, slowly, slowly come and try to touch, and their idea is that when I touch a particular stone, then the water comes. <laughs> and I remember very clearly, I was there, and I, I always thought, you know, it's me who touched the particular stone, this proper stone. It's because of me. And I'm sure all other children who were playing there, they also had this idea, it's me, I know, I know. And next time you run there and you know this particular stone and you try to touch it, but somehow it doesn't work immediately, but you still try it and, and again it works. And, and you have this impression, yeah, I know, I found the secret. And when I <clears throat> became an adult and I came to this and I saw this scene, and the children were playing, and they were running and yelling, and the water were coming and going. And then I saw one little man, he was sitting on the bench, <clears throat> totally unnoticed, you know. He's sitting nearby, and he had little thing underneath his feet, and he would turn it, and then the water would come. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would turn it back, and the water subsided. <laughs> so. And every children, every child would think, that's me. And he's sitting there and thinking, yeah, yeah, but it's actually me. So Krishna is sitting there and pulling the strings of our karma. And we think, it's me. It's because of me. I know the secret. I know how to behave. It worked. You know, and then you try it again. And it doesn't work. And you wonder why. It worked first time. But it worked not because you did it. Because Krishna pulled the string. <laughs> because the law of karma which he created uh, creates this situation. And we're foolish enough. We're very foolish. We work... I mean, it's not that we shouldn't work hard. We should work hard uh, in order to Krishna to push the button, but uh, still, you know, what I want to say is that we shouldn't invest ego in it. Why do we create karma? The very reason of karma, why karma is there, the very reason of karma is that uh, because we invest our ego in our action. If we do the same action without ego, the karma would not be there. That's exactly what Krishna is trying to teach us, how to uh, lead the life which will not create karma, which will not create any uh, bad consequences for you. No ego. I am not a doer. Krishna is the doer. I am doing something on behalf of him. I am doing it as, as his agent, not, not as an independent agent. This agency, which is ego, Ego is the agency. I'm the agent. I'm doer. I'm the doer. So that's what creates karma, nothing else. You know, the, the famous example which is given there, you know, somebody is, is riding in a train. And, you know, he's riding in a train, and then he puts all his luggage on his head. And he says, I'm helping the train to carry my luggage. No, <laughs> you are working yourself out, that's for sure. <laughs> you become completely, ah, 
and you, you feel, you know, I'm helping the train. No, just put it down. No problem. Train will carry it. So some people, they're so emotionally burdened because of this ego. I'm doing this. You should do the same, but you should know you are in the train, in the train of your karma. And uh, the train will carry you to the destination. In the meantime, don't try to overburden you by this useless idea that I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Try to do the real thing. And the real thing is sadhana. Because uh, what is there is there. You are carried by the train. So many, you know, you will stop in a certain places. Only in a certain places you will stop and you will get some bell puri or, uh, and some people will give you chai, 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 and, you know, tomato soup or whatever they give there. <laughs> so you will get what you're supposed to get in the train. Uh, but uh, at this, in the meantime, use this time, very important time, to achieve something very significant. And this significant, what you are supposed to achieve, is described by Krishna in this verse. The significant thing which will make difference. Anything else doesn't make any difference. Anything else is just, it's the same, you know, the same old thing, you know, you will get some veg cutlets or whatever is there <laughs> in the train. Uh, it doesn't make so much difference. But what makes difference is to remember about God. <clears throat> this point of remembrance, I wanted to say a few words about this. This point of remembrance is crucial. Because it is said, Satatam smartavyam vishnukvi smartavyam najatu chit. Sarva vidi nishede siuh etayoreva kinkara. That all the spiritual practice which is there, whatever you take, any spiritual practice which is there in Smriti Shastra, in Dharma Shastra, in Tantra Shastra, whatever Shastra you take, whatever spiritual practice is there, whatever ritual is there, the goal is one. What is the goal? Remember God and never forget about Him. Sarva vidi vidnishadesu hetayoreva kinkarak. They're all serving this purpose. That's the only purpose. And that's exactly what Krishna is saying here. And that's exactly what he is explaining in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, well, it's not him, it's one of the Agendras, but anyway. So, uh, there is a beautiful verse in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is very fundamental to our practices. Our Smriti becomes our memory, our Mm, uh, power to remember God becomes perverted. Vipariya. And because it becomes Vipariya, we remember all other things we don't remember about God. Dvitiya binivesha. Bayam. And because, because of this Dvitiya binivesha, because our consciousness is absorbed in something secondary, not primary. We don't remember about God who is the prime principle of this life. And we remember about everything else. We remember so many things in our life. And uh, he says, the Pariya Smriti, our Smriti becomes perverted, and uh, therefore uh, we are uh, constantly in fear. We are ultimately in fear. That's why our depression is there. We don't know what's going to happen. Oil crisis is there. My goodness, oil crisis, Ooh, ah. and economic crisis, and ecological crisis, and war in Syria, and war in somewhere else, and, and this terrorist, and this and that. And ultimately, we are afraid of death. Everyone is afraid of death. Whether you believe that you're afraid of death or not, sometimes people say, I'm not afraid of death. He's not afraid of death, but he's afraid of being fired from the war. <laughs> it's the same. It's, it's different, all fears which we have in this life is actually coming from this fear of death that everything will be finished. And why we have this fear? Because we don't remember about God. And Krishna himself says, if you remember about God at the time of death, 
then you will come to me. You will not be fearful even at the time of death. Death is a very fearful time. Believe it or not. And every one of us knows, every one of us has a lot of experience of dying again and again and again. <laughs> Actually, this is what uh, Vyasadev is explaining in his commentary to Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. He explains that why everyone has the fear of death, because everyone already experienced death. How we can fear something which we didn't experience? He says, this is the proof of Punarjanma, the proof of reincarnation. The, the very fact that everyone is so fearful, even, even a little cockroach is fearful of death. Even a little baby who is totally unconscious, he is fearful of death. Because it's there in our memory how, how painful it is to give up everything. How painful it is to change the whole situation and to undergo such a uh, painful transformation. Therefore, Krishna says, there is only one real success in life. And this real success is to remember him at the time of death. But how to remember him at the time of death? He explains uh, in the next verse, not in the next verse, in the verse after this, where he said, Tasmat sarveshu kalishu mamanusmara yudecha. He says that uh, to remember me at the time of death, yes, to remember me at the time of death, it's not enough just to know that I have to remember about Krishna at the time of death. Sometimes people think that they can cheat God, <laughs> that they can uh, really, at the time of death, and sometimes they read this story about Ajamil. A Jamil story, oh yeah. And I, I, sometimes people even call their son Narayana to reenact this pastime. You know, there is a nice funny story about one man uh, who was a complete nonsense. He was a sinner number one and he was doing all kinds of nonsense in life. But then he uh, read this story about A Jamil. And he thought, oh, that's a good idea. Let me call my young son, younger son, Narayana. And then I will remember uh, Narayana at the time of death. So he called his younger son, Narayana. And uh, his elder son, he called mm, Duruhu or something like this. Some not a very spiritual name. So at the time of death, when he was dying, he told his brother, you please bring my son Narayan to my deathbed so that I will see him and I will call him. That was his idea because he really thought it's a good idea, you know, just to remember this. And uh, so his brother uh, brought his young son uh, Narayan to him uh, and he looked at him and said, hey, uh, you, uh, the younger brother of Duruhu, what are you doing here? <laughs> so, the point of this story is that you cannot cheat God. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not that, you know, you do nonsense on your life and uh, all your life, and then at the very moment of death, you will remember God. Not possible. Therefore, Krishna himself says, Sadatat Bhava Bhavitaha. He says that, you know, if you want to really remember me about uh, at, the, uh, at the time of death, you should cultivate this bhava always. Sadatat bhava bhavitaha. You should always try to remember uh, uh, me. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada explains this. He says basically uh, that uh, this, is, uh, this is the practice. This is... He says, it's not possible to remember about God for somebody who didn't practice Krishna consciousness in his life. Krishna consciousness cannot be practiced at the moment of death. At the moment of death, you can only practice death. There is nothing else you can practice at that time. 
And whatever you achieved during your lifetime, whatever you, uh, memory you have during your lifetime, whatever samskaras you have, the strongest samskara will surface uh, in your brain. Whatever has the most power uh, in it, uh, that will surface. And if you practice Krishna consciousness uh, all your life, then definitely you will remember about God in this moment of your life and the moment of death. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very important to understand this principle. It's a science. King Kula Shekhar, he, always, he also says, Krishna Tvadiya Padapanka Chapanja Ratnam Pradyayva Me Vishatavana Saraja Hamsa Prana Prayana Samaye Kapavata Pite Kanta Varodana Vidho Smaranam Kutaste Prana Prayana When my prana will be coming out of my body Prana Prayana Samaye Kapavata Pite Everything will be disturbed Your mind will be disturbed because your body will be very disturbed your body will be a mess. We all know how difficult it is to remember about Krishna when we have some physical pain. Little pain in your finger. Or, my goodness, toothache. <laughs> you don't remember about Krishna. You only remember about your tooth. Your whole consciousness is there in your tooth. And you think, you know, my God. <laughs> so uh, it, it's like this, and it's just one little tooth. Just imagine what's going to happen if your whole body is a mess. Kapavata pita. It's very difficult to control mind uh, even during your lifetime. Is it easy to control your mind now? No. How you can control your mind at the time of death? There is only one way to do it. Spiritual practice. And the essence, we have to be very clear about this. The essence of spiritual practice is uh, to try to remember about Krishna all the time. Tasmat sarveshu kalishu mamanusmara yudhyacha. You fight, Krishna says. Mama Nusmara. Anusmara means constantly remember about me. Mama Nusmara and fight. Sarveshu Kalishu, Mama Nusmara Yudhacha, my Arpita Mano Budhir. You please give me Maya Arpita. Please give me uh, your mind and your intelligence. Your memory, and, uh, which is there in intelligence, should be given to me. So, uh, if we are talking about spiritual practices, let me say a few words about the proper spiritual practice. The spiritual practice, what is the goal of spiritual practice? The goal is to remember, right? Uh, but why we cannot remember immediately? We read Bhagavad Gita, we read Srimad Bhagavatam, few stories. Why we can't remember about Krishna? Because there are too many other things in our, in our brain, right? In our memory, there are so many subject matters to remember. So the first goal of spiritual practice is to remove the unwanted things from our mind. Is to deactivate all those samskaras which are there. And therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, that's the first effect of chanting. Cheto darpa namarjana. The first effect of chanting is that all these samskaras, they become a little less active. In our life, uh, when we have all these memories and samskaras, and you know, it's, it's very difficult to remember about Krishna because we remember about somebody else. If somebody else told you, you are a fool, you will only remember this person. You will have dreams about him. <laughs> you will remember him day and night. How dare he said that I'm fool, or I'm bad, or I'm mad, you know. Somebody, some fool told you that you're a fool, and you are a fool. <laughs> because you remember about him. Yeah, it's a proof that we're a fool. <laughs> 
Because we only remember about this. We don't remember about God. <laughs> you know? What difference does it make? You will die anyway and he will die. <laughs> if you are too much worried about this, just think, he will also die. Don't worry. <laughs> But you should worry what is there in your consciousness. And we have this consciousness, this very sensitive consciousness. What I want to say is that we are very impressible people. And uh, usually uh, we remember something which has come to us with some emotion attached. Why do we remember uh, this? you know, foolish person who offended us. Because at that time, our ego reacted emotionally. And this strong emotional reaction made such a deep samskara in our mind, such a deep memory, because the emotion is so strong. You know, we usually only think, only remember those things, either which we repeat all the time, and therefore, it is said, if you want to remember something, you have to repeat it again and again and again. <laughs> and that works. That creates some scar, a very deep impression, or something which is attached with the emotions. Because this is emotions which gives the energy to some scar. The karma which we commit, why the karma is so persistent? Why karma follows us life after life after life <laughs> runs after us and we cannot really escape it because there is some energy. When we create certain actions and uh, if emotion is attached to this action, then this action creates very energetic, very filled with energy samskara. And this samskara will demand, will actually modify our behavior, change our behavior. So the first thing which spiritual practice has to do, and we have to be very clear about this, the first thing which spiritual practice will have to do is to remove the unwanted samskaras. And therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Chaita Darpana Marjanam, the mirror of our mind will be cleared by this chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. And as I said, it's a very scientific process. We really have to be, you know, we shouldn't be blind believers. Blind belief is not good. Srila Prabhupada explains this in Bhagavad Gita. He says that blind belief is, blind faith is useless. So we have to really understand how it works. And we can see, you know, if we chant the holy name, and if we chant it properly, the point of my little talk is how to do it properly. If we chant the holy name properly, we see that the memories are still there about our past experiences, but they are not so persistent. They are not coming again and again and again. They are not really uh, chasing after us. They are not really haunting us. Why the past is called Buddha Kal? Because it's Buddha. <laughs> and Bhut is, is after us, haunting us. <laughs> Our past is haunting us. Did you notice it? <laughs> so if we try to do, if we do spiritual practice properly, for sure, 100% guaranteed, then this uh, haunting past uh, will lose its power over us. What does it mean? It basically means that samskara is still there, the memory is still there, but it's not active anymore. The problem with active samskara, if it's there, it pushes us. It really forces us to act even against our will. As Arjuna speaks in Bhagavad Gita, he says that, you know, what is this force which is pushing me to act even if I don't want to act? And this, this force is is the memory which is there in form of desire. Krishna will answer, Kama Esha, Krodha Esha, Rajaguna, Samud Bhava. This is Kama, desire. But desire is coming from memory, from samskaras. When samskara becomes vasana, and vasana means very deep samskara, 
habit, tendency which is there, the feature of your character. When vasana has, when samskara becomes habit, becomes vasana, then it will push you to do. You will become slave of this vasana. And that's a very strong desire. So what happens when you chant, when you chant the holy name, then uh, this, uh, this memory which is there, the samskara or vasana which is there becomes weaker or becomes disconnected. Those of you who work with computers or who know how computers work, and I'm sure there's plenty of you uh, who do this, they know when you erase file from the disk, does it erase the file? No. no, the file is there. What does it erase? Index. Index. Index by which you connect, by which you can find this file. So exactly the same thing is happening when you chant the holy name. Indexes of the old files becoming erased. And if you want to recover these files, you can recover it, right? <laughs> You go to dustbin and there are so many files out there, <laughs> you know. And they're there, they're lying there just in case you need them. <laughs> but basically, when you chant the holy name, then this index is removed and uh, it's not easily accessible anymore. When, when you have this active memory, the active memory means uh, practically that uh, you can very easily access to any file which is in use, so to speak. They are active. But what the holy name does, it basically pushes them aside, makes them not so active. You know, you have all these nice samskaras of lust and greed and uh, anger. And sometimes when people feel that they are losing this, they become really afraid and they say, no, no, not now, not now, please. <laughs> but the first thing which we, uh, uh, when we approach God, how we approach him? What is the first name we chant? Hari, right? Hari. Hare. It means who? One who takes away the unwanted things. We tell him, please take away all this garbage which is there in my dustbin. And then when he tries it, we say, no, no, not now. <laughs> I may still need it. <laughs> it's always like this. And that is called offense <laughs> to the holy name. <laughs> it is actually the last offense when we attach to all our conception, I and mine. If you know the list of the 10 offenses, we know that the last offense is to be attached to all these concepts which are there, and we're all guilty of this offense. Subconsciously, we are attached to our ideas, to our samskaras, to our ways of doing things. And therefore, as I said, the first thing which spiritual practice has to do is to remove unwanted things, and then it should create new samskaras, spiritual samskaras, which will ultimately penetrate the soul. It should create bhakti samskaras. It deactivates the material samskaras, makes it a uh, little uh, not so active, but then it also side by side creates uh, spiritual samskaras, bhakti samskaras, samskaras of bhakti. Therefore, we come every Friday or every Saturday, every Sunday, depending on the country. Uh, therefore, we come to the temple to create samskara. Therefore, we hear about God to create samskara. And uh, what is most important, therefore we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Again, to create very strong samskara. So that this samskara is very much alive. And it is said actually uh, by Rupa Goswami that uh, this samskara penetrates your soul uh, when you reach the level of bhav. In the beginning, it's in your consciousness, in your chitta. 
but still it's very good to have this samskara in your material consciousness. But ultimately, when it becomes very deep and very profound and very strong, it reaches your soul. And the ultimate goal of spiritual practice is this. Because we say that the goal of spiritual practice is to attain the level of bhava. And the level of bhava is that when the bhakti samskara, when, when the practice, when the bhakti as a practice becomes your nature, it basically means when it reaches the soul, when it reaches the level of the soul. But for that, it has to be very, very strong. Otherwise, it remains on the surface and it doesn't go very deep. So basically what it means, it means that whatever we do, we should do uh, with very deep understanding what we're doing and try to help to form proper samskara. When we chant the holy name, we should be very much aware. Because if we are not aware while we're chanting, what's happening, we just let all the old memories to surface. You know, we chant, we all know how it works. We chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, no, no, yeah, right, right. <laughs> You know, it's exactly what happens with computer. If you let the computer idle for some time, then what comes to the screen? <laughs> screen saver. We have plenty of screen savers in our memory. <laughs> And when we chant one screensaver, and we know that you know, so many screensavers are all oh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's chanting is not about watching the screensavers. <laughs> chanting is about remembering Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. and make our memory very strong, make our memory very profound. <laughs> We're creating nice samskaras for bhakti. And uh, the most important thing, which I again uh, want to say, is that uh, sometimes when we practice improperly, then the improper samskaras are created. And it basically means that we will not reach Krishna. It will mean that uh, we will be born again with these samskaras which we created, improper samskaras. Therefore, uh, any spiritual practice consists of two things. What you should do and what you should not do. <laughs> what you should avoid. We know uh, that in our bhakti practices, we have to do sadhana, and sadhana means shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu, smaranam, Pada Sevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam. Uh, and uh, it starts with Shravanam and Kirtanam. Shravanam and Kirtanam we have to do. This is our practice. This is a very powerful practice. And we should try to do it properly. It means that we should be very attentive. Not just, you know, yes, yes, yes. Very soon Sunday feast will be there. <laughs> prasadam, Prasadam, Prasadam. Yes, give me Prasadam. Yeah, this is Prasadam. <laughs> Actually, this is what Arjuna says. At the end of Bhagavad Gita, he says, Nashta moha smritir labdvat. Vat prasadam. How is this? Vat prasadat. Because of your mercy, because of your prasad, <laughs> I regained my memory. So the, again, the point of practice is to regain memory, which is covered now, and to dissipate illusion. This is the two points of practice, nashta moha spritir labdva. And this is only possible by the mercy, by the mercy of Krishna and the mercy of devotees. And uh, uh, when we do it properly, uh, then it will come. And properly means we have to listen properly, we have to chant properly, means with attention, with awareness. Uh, then very soon all the offenses, all, all the sins will go. And what is the thing which, which is forbidden to us? Offenses, right? We should do the practice and we should avoid offenses. Because what offenses do, they create wrong samskaras. They create improper samskaras. 
they uh, make the impression of spiritual practice wrong. You know, I know some people, they basically uh, deprive uh, the chanting of the power. If you're offensive, you don't feel the bliss of the chanting. I know so many people, people, they, devotees, they, uh, they complain to me and they say to me, you know, I, I had such a nice time, I was chanting, it was so blissful, and then I offended somebody, it was all gone. And I cannot regain it. Why? Because, because you did something improper, Krishna is not happy with you, devotees are not happy with you, and you create a thrown samskara, which will be there, in your consciousness for a long time, depriving you from the real experience, from the real experience of spiritual practice. So we have to be very clear uh, while we are practicing, then only we will reach Krishna. Like here Krishna says, Yati Madhbhavam, you will reach, you will attain, you will come. Yati Madhbhavam, Nastyatra Samshaya, there is no doubt about it, you will reach me. But how we will reach him you know, let's say you're in a car, and suddenly is a car. Suddenly is a very good car produced in Vaikuntha factory. <laughs> yeah, suddenly is really a vehicle which can bring you to Krishna. For sure. Antah kalecha, my wife. At the end of your uh, life, you will remember about Krishna. You will attain him. He says the car will come to destination. But we all know that uh, to operate the car, you have to do two things. You have to push the gas, right? And you have to, you have to release the brake, right? Can you drive with the brake on? Perhaps you can, but there will be a lot of smoke from the tires. You know, your brakes is on and you're... But the brakes are on. Offenses is the brake. You know, when we chant that at the same time, the offensive mentality is there. When we're not humble, when we're not tolerant, when we're not really practicing in a proper way, then it means that the brake is there and uh, there is only smoke coming. Sometimes people complain, you know, I don't feel any progress, I don't feel any advancement, I'm chanting 20 years. My dear sir, you can chant 700 lifetimes without any effect. This is said specifically in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. No effect if you continue doing offenses because your brakes are on. You've not really started your journey. You're still there. And the brakes are simple. You're attached to your concept, I and mine. This is a very subtle thing. We have to release these brakes. No, I am mine. I am Krishna's. Nothing is mine. Everything belongs to Krishna. <laughs> what I am doing? I am his servant. I am his happy servant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare, 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 Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. But if you, you have this, all these offenses there, if you have these brakes on, then uh, it will be very difficult for you to reach the destination and ultimately you will not achieve it. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada in this purport, in this beautiful purport, he says, you will not remember about Krishna if you didn't practice Krishna consciousness. First you have to practice properly, and then he says, Trinadati sunichina taror ivasa hishnuna amanina manadina kirtani yasadahari. That's the proper chanting. The proper chanting, if you have this proper frame of mind, proper mentality, you're humble and you're very tolerant. And you're ready to overcome all the impediments which will be there as a test of your sincerity. Krishna will send you many impediments. People like to worship Ganesh because Ganesh removes impediments. And Krishna sends impediments. <laughs> to make you stronger, to make you spiritually stronger, to test your sincerity. You know, we will have to undergo many impediments, and it's nice, it's blissful. If we are determined 
And if we are together with devotees, then uh, we will have proper consciousness. And as we all know, if we are together with devotees, one has to be very tolerant like a tree. Because with devotees, it's impossible not to be tolerant. You know, some sannyasi from Russia comes and he gives long class. <laughs> you have to tolerate this. <laughs> you know, it's long overdue. <laughs> this and that. So many points of tolerance are there. But yeah, that's, that's bhakti. <laughs> you know, we, have to, we have to take all these problems. <laughs> But be very clear that this is the goal. This is the real success. Everything else is failure. Any other goal which you will achieve is ultimately failure. And you will fail royally. <laughs> you will be depressed. You will be morose. You will be totally, completely in distress in the time of death. But if you remember about Krishna, you will be the most blissful creature in this world. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Mother, as you said, thank you very much for wonderful and technical secretary class. Mother, Mother, as you said, our karmas haunts us. Haunts us. So, nowadays, uh, nowadays it is very prominent heart trouble. It is going on. Suppose one heart of one body is coming into the another body. So the karmas of that body will transfer to this body. <laughs> the karma, uh, the question is when your heart is transplanted, whether you get some karma of somebody else with the heart together. No, karma sticks not to the heart. Karma sticks to the agent. It is said that karma is like karma is like a calf. If you get real calf, if you get a little calf, he will always find his mother. Even if there are so many other cows, he will only go to his mother. Because he knows I'm her. So it is said that karma is exactly like this. Karma knows to whom it belongs. <laughs> See, it's not possible that somebody does something and somebody else will get the consequences. No. <laughs> the consequence will come to the agent. If you have this agency, I'm doing this. If you have this consciousness, I'm the doer. Uh, the results of your action will come only to you, not to anyone else. Don't worry about heart transplantation. You may transplant your heart, you may transplant your head. <laughs> Karma will stick to you. <laughs> no escape.